It's a full house today. Josh Rogan, Michael Gordon. Uh-oh. Uh, I have a couple of items for all of you at the top. Uh, as you uh, all probably saw, we just had uh, an important bilateral meeting with uh, the Japanese, with Foreign Mi Minister Kushida. Secretary Kerry and Foreign Minister, Minister Kushida gave extensive comments uh, after the meeting to read out the meeting, but um, they did discuss a full range, of course, of bilateral, regional, and global issues, reflect, reflecting the strength and breadth of our alliance with Japan. Uh, and you saw the Secretary say at the end of the, his comments that he looks forward to more discussions in the, in the weeks and months and years ahead. Uh, on a lighter note, uh, the opening ceremonies, as you all know, of the 2014 Winter Olympics occurred at 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time this morning and will be broadcast in the United States tonight. We are, of course, very proud of Team USA, a team that represents the diversity, openness, and inclusion of the United States. And we just wanted to show you a little video uh, while we're here in honor of the uh, kickoff. Every four years, the world gathers to compete in the Olympic Games, to rediscover the phenomenon of connection that transcends differences of team uniform, language, and culture, which is powered by a shared universal passion for love of the sport. Hello, I'm Michelle Kwan, and here at the U.S. Department of State, we believe that the Olympic and Paralympic Games are a time to showcase the power of sports to promote cultural understanding among people around the world. So we wish all athletes good luck as they compete in the 2014 Winter Olympics and Paralympics. Sports diplomacy, I'm sure we can chat about that as well. Uh, in honor of the Winter Olympics and in support of uh, Team USA, we'd like to spotlight an athlete of a day at the Daily Press Briefing throughout the Games. So today's athlete is Washington Capitals defenseman John Carlson, who obviously the Secretary saw last evening. A native of Massachusetts, Carlson was raised in New Jersey and has been with the Capitals organization since he was drafted in 2008. Over the past few seasons, he has established himself as a top defensive player in the N NHL and on January 1st, he was named to the U.S. Olympics team. Uh, he has been a spokesman for the Inova Blood Drive and is a frequent volunteer for CAPS Care, the branch of the organization that manages community involvement. And of course, he represented the CAPS last night uh, when the secretary dropped the puck. Uh, team USA enters the Olympic hockey tournament as one of the top contenders. Uh, but home team Russia, defending world champ Sweden, and defending gold medalist Canada all pre present significant challenges. That's the extent of my hockey knowledge, so hopefully that's not a topic. Uh, last piece, of course, we have a full house here, so I want to welcome the members of the D.C. National Guard Public Affairs team, representing the D.C. National Guard and D.C. Air National Guard. Uh, we also have uh, Ben Cormier, a transatlantic fellow who's with us today. Um, and my youngest sister is here, who's the, by far the coolest and most interesting member of the family. Hopefully my other sister doesn't take that offensively. So with that, uh, let's turn to you, Matt. Well, I don't know how you expect your other sister not to take that. <laughs> she agrees. She <laughs> yes. agrees. We all agree. Go ahead. <laughs> and we won't hold the... Uh, Mr. Carlson's team affiliation against him as we cheer for Team USA. Okay, that, and However, Matt is very patriotic today, so I wanted to point that out well, as well. So I had to convert. This is a Bills scarf that I'm the same Good. color, so multiple I uses. It to team USA. Um, listen, before we get back to Japan, which I'm sure that uh, a lot of people here had to ask questions about, um, I just want to wrap uh, up something, hopefully very quickly, sure. from um, yesterday and Toria's phone call. Mm -hmm. Um, you have seen the comments from uh, Chancellor Merkel's uh, spokesperson saying mm -hmm. that this is unacceptable. Do you uh, do you have any thoughts on that? Do you agree? Well, I, I think if you were to, if Toria were standing back here again, she would convey to you that she apologized. Uh, obviously, because that's not doesn't reflect how she feels about our relationship with the EU. It's also important to note that she's been in close touch with EU officials since then, not about this, but about work we're doing together on Ukraine. Uh, so uh, we have a long and enduring relationship with Germany. Uh, 
The Secretary was just there last week, as you know, and discussed a range of bilateral issues we work on, and we expect uh, we'll be back to business as usual with them as well. Right, but she, in the phone call, she didn't say F Germany. She said F the EU. I, I so, know. I am familiar with what she said. Right. So, uh, so, but, uh, so it's, a, it's a broader thing here. I mean, what is your, what is your response? I mean, do you think that Merkel is, that, that, that the Germans are taking this, blowing this out of proportion? I mean, what's, do you, is your, what would your response be to her? Is it the diplomatic equivalent of like, you know, lighten up Angela or something? What, what, what is it? <laughs> I think I would. I think we're just conveying that. Obviously, we've moved forward in our relationship with the EU, and uh, and and okay. Assistant Secretary Newland has done that, and we're focused on our work together on Ukraine. So we're hopeful right. everybody can. So then you said that it doesn't reflect the comment doesn't reflect the U.S. attitude toward the EU. Well, if it doesn't, why did she say it? Uh, Was again, it just a momentary lapse, uh, or what? What? As I said yesterday, Matt, uh, there are moments of. Uh, of small frustration in every relationship. Uh, okay. What you do is you move beyond them, you discuss the tough issues, you discuss them through diplomatic channels, and uh, evidence of that is, is the ongoing work we're doing with Ukraine, uh, with EU on Ukraine. Tell, please, sure, yeah. let's just um, go one at a time. We have on, plenty of time. Go on, ahead. Uh, <clears throat> on the issue of how you discuss things, um, do State Department officials routinely use encrypted phones, mobile phones, for their conversations so that <laughs> comments like that one do not become public? Uh, well, Arshad, for obvious reasons, I can't outline for you everything uh, that we do. Uh, I can tell you that uh, data encryption is available for all da Department of State employee uh, issue issued government-owned BlackBerry devices, regardless of rank. Uh, all Department of State government-owned BlackBerry devices have data encryption. Uh, however, they don't have voice encryption. And of course, as you know, I know you didn't ask this, but uh, just to add one more additional point, classified processing and classified conversation on a personal uh, digital assisted device is prohibited in, in, in accordance with department policy, which of course is not what this was, but, but just a, an added okay, point. Okay, so they don't have voice encryption. So nobody at the State Department has a phone where their voice, a mobile phone where their voice can be encrypted? I'm not going to outline it further for obvious reasons. I think uh, we don't need to convey every step we take and every precaution we take. Uh, that's the information I can provide to all of you. Does the Secretary, uh, I mean, I, I think it's perfectly reasonable to ask if the Secretary of State has a mobile phone or access to a mobile phone near him or her with voice encryption? I think it's perfectly reasonable to ask, but I think uh, it's perfectly reasonable not to answer either. So, I mean, here's the problem, though. <clears throat> if you're not answering that about the Secretary of State, mm -hmm. it leaves open the possibility that he or she does not, in fact, have access to an encrypted cell phone, which would suggest that all kinds of secret, top secret, classified, private comments that he or she might make could be accessed by the intelligence services well, of I other countries. Well, I just said that I, classified I, processing and classified conversation on a, a personal digital assisted device is prohibited. Uh, beyond that, I'm, all I'm conveying is that we're not going to outline every step and precaution we've taken, uh, what we have access to, whether that's the secretary or anyone else in the administration. So, so but here's, I mean, I don't, uh, several things I understand. When you say personal, do you mean privately owned? Any device that is that you're having conversations on that is okay. So you're not allowed to discuss classified material on a, a device, correct? On an unclassified, right? Exactly. Okay. So then the next question is, um, uh, was uh, Assistant Secretary Newland discussing classified matters on this phone? I don't think anyone would 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 take that as a as a as a description of what what. Happen. Okay. Well, then the next question is, though, why would you not be able to at least tell us that the secretary has the capability, indeed routinely uses, a an encrypted cell phone? Uh, we have a range of capabilities, obviously, that many people have access to. I'm not going to outline them from the podium because I don't. Uh, we don't think there's an advantage in that. But, but here's the thing. I mean, I can understand why you wouldn't want to say everybody up to the rank sure. of, you know, PDAS doesn't mm -hmm. have one, but everyone above does, because then presumably people would start bugging the lower ranks. 
But if you can't even say that the secretary does, it leaves open the question of whether his or her conversations can actually be private. Well, it's, I would, I would uh, convey, Arshad, that it, it, we're not going to convey every capability we have, every capacity we have, uh, in any public forum, and certainly not from the podium. So and I'll leave it at that. Other than the um, restriction on uh, using or on discussing classified mm -hmm. information on a PDA, um, is there any other restriction on the kinds of things you should or should not discuss on a, on a PDA, or is that the only one, just classified material? I, I'm happy to check if there's more of a, anything more that we can publicly share with all of you that we could send out to you so after the briefing. Go ahead. I don't know if you're aware that there's a second tape that seems to have come out, this time a conversation between two uh, senior EU officials. So my mm -hmm. first question is, um, given this is a second tape in two days and yesterday you seem to suggest that you believed that there was some Russian hand in this. Do you see this as a part of a deeper campaign by Moscow to try and derail the ongoing talks between the EU and Ukraine? Well, I don't have anything new to add from yesterday, and I certainly don't have anything uh, new to add about a, a separate report of, a, of a, another, uh, another taped call. Uh, I will say, though, that uh, you know this is, an, and I would point you all. I think many of you have seen that that Assistant Secretary Newland did a press conference this morning. So I'd certainly point you to that first. But uh, you know the Russians were the first to tweet about this particular call. Uh, only a few countries have the level of capabilities needed. I'll let you use your own judgment. I don't have any new information beyond yesterday. Um, our focus, of course, is on. Uh, and the mission of the United States, I should say, continues to be to encourage a conversation between the government, the opposition, civil society. We're working with the EU on that. Uh, and we have continued to make the case that it's up to the people of Ukraine and the uh, voices of the people of Ukraine to determine the path forward. The question here is, what do the Russians want? Why this campaign of distraction? Uh, and, uh, you know, that's the larger question I think we should all be focused so you on. you believe there's a campaign of distraction going on to try and derail the talks then? Uh, I, I, I think uh, it's distracting from the issue at hand, which is, uh, and I wouldn't go so far as derail the talks as much of as distract from the issue at hand, which is the voices of the people of Ukraine and what they want to see in their future. Okay, and, and I wanted to just, sorry, on this, mm -hmm. on this same call, um, the, one of the senior officials, Helga Schmidt, is heard to be saying um, that, in fact, the, you know, the EU is on board with the United States. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, if this tape is correct, what she says, allegedly, is what you should know is that it really bothers us that the Americans are going around naming and shaming us, which goes back to the questions we had yesterday mm -hmm. about the frustrations in your relationship. And I don't, you say that you've moved beyond this, mm -hmm. but obviously, if these comments are correct, the Europeans are equally unhappy well, as, as I don't think any of us have any details of when that call took place, what it was a reflection of, what the context was. What I'm conveying to you is that Assistant Secretary Newland, since this this uh, reported call was tape was released, has been in close touch with the EU, has been working closely with them on moving the path forward in Ukraine, and that's a reflection of our relationship. So you do not believe that there's a rift between the EU and the United States on what to do about the crisis in Ukraine? Uh, we do not. We're working closely with them. Do you agree on every component of every step at every moment? Of course not. It's a too complex of an issue. But that's why we're engaged in the discussion and why we're working so closely on it. Should I just go back to mm -hmm. question, but also your sure. answer, your answer to, to Joe just mm -hmm. now. Um, you said only a few countries have the, have the level of capability needed, but one, one wonders if that's actually correct, since, I mean, I seem to recall British newspapers being able to hack into people's cell phones pretty easily, and they're certainly not countries, uh, intelligence services. Are you saying that you don't think that you, the Ukrainian domestic intelligence service is, is able to intercept and record phone calls? I, I wasn't trying and, to make a specific point. I was trying, really, trying to make a broad point. And are you really trying to destroy BlackBerry that much by <laughs> naming them as the uh, as the as the sole provider? What I am a BlackBerry know, Arshad, user. Uh, Arshad is you know <laughs> always interested in market moving things. So it just seems to be unusual. Are you can can you get voice encryption on a BlackBerry device? Do you know? I, I don't have that level of technical detail, but I'm happy when I follow up with Arshad's question to see if there's. Her, 
more specific. Are you whatever your policies mm -hmm. now are, which you're not willing to divulge, including right. whether or not the Secretary of State can use it and That's correct. <coughs> as voice encryption. Mm -hmm. um, are you rethinking your policies in the light of this incident? We're always taking a look at that. Always. We're always evaluating. I'm not aware of a new look, but we're evaluating every single day, Arshad. Well, why wouldn't you take another look at it now? Well, we evaluate based on a range of events, not just events that are uh, related to a publicly released conversation. So I'll just say we take in a lot of data and consider a lot of factors, and we're constantly evaluating the best way to keep our conversations private. So, Jen, are you then um, confident in the security of your diplomatic communications and all diplomatic channels at this point? Certainly we are, but I think it's important to remind all of you that even as we communicate with American citizens about uh, whether it's travel to certain countries or what, uh, what to be cognizant of, and this is all information available on our website, we do in indicate and make clear when there are concerns about when information can be tapped. So we're cognizant of this, we're aware of this, and we are constantly taking precautions and updating our, our approach. So when on TAPS, mm -hmm. so you believe that uh, Assistant Secretary Newland was being bugged? I don't have any other further analysis for you than what I provided yesterday. In, in mm -hmm. terms of your answers to all of these questions so far, specifically the technical kind of technical questions, mm -hmm. you are you believe or you know that what, at least one part of one person involved in this conversation was using a BlackBerry or a, a, some kind of a cell phone. I correct? don't I don't know for fact uh, the details of what phone lines uh, individuals were on. All right, but. Is it, do you have any concerns because of this incident that the embassy in either the embassy in Kiev itself or the EUR bureau here, this building more generally, is uh, that the security of it has been compromised somehow? Is there any Not that I'm aware that? of, Matt. Would you be aware of if 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 there if this were a, a concern? Uh, again, obviously we're closely looking at this, I, I, or not at this, but we're closely looking at. Uh, these cases every single day. I don't have any new information for you. You said mm -hmm. that you are confident in, in response to um, uh, my colleague's question. You said that you are confident uh, in the security of your diplomatic communications. Given one WikiLeaks and two this, why are you confident? Well, I think, Arshad, we've always uh, been clear and been clear-eyed, I should say, that we need to be vigilant. Uh, as it relates to conversations, as it relates to information. Um, but I'm not, what I'm conveying to you is we're not taking one released call as an indication that our systems are not working. No, no, I get that. And mm -hmm. I, I ask the question only because I'm not so sure I would be so confident. Mm -hmm. I know that there were a whole series of reforms that were undertaken sure. post WikiLeaks sure. to try to restrict the access. Mm -hmm there, uh, but it's not clear to me, particularly since you haven't made clear whether or not you are actually rethinking your communications equipment or policies in the light of this, it's not clear to me why I would be confident in the security of communications. So I, I don't understand why you are so confident. Okay. Do you have a question? Yeah. Or? Why are you confident <laughs> that your communications are secure when you have an example within apparently the last two weeks of a communication being apparently tapped and broadcast? Well, what I'm conveying, Arshad, is that we're constantly evaluating and reviewing uh, how we, pro how we uh, communicate, whether that's internally or externally. I'm not going to share all of that uh, from the podium because it wouldn't be appropriate to do that. Uh, but it hasn't changed our official evaluation of uh, the ability and the capacity of our diplomats to communicate. Can we move on to Syria? Uh, do we have any more on this? Okay, go ahead. But just to be clear, you're, there's no specific investigation into this breach. Is that what you're saying? Uh, not that I'm aware of, Josh. Okay, and have you demarched the Ukrainians or the Russians over this? Uh, I'd have to check on that. Can you take that question? I'm happy to. Thank you. Sure. Which one? Whether you demarched both of them and whether uh, you said you're not aware of any specific investigation. And I'm not aware of any demarching, but I, I want to just, you, of course, check on that. Can you sure. check both of them, whether there is a specific investigation into this incident as well? Uh, certainly. I mean, just not to put too fine a point on this, but obviously uh, Ukrainians were part of the conversation as well that was released. I understand it's representative of the opposition, but uh, do we have any more on this specific topic? Yeah, yeah. Oh, go ahead, Catherine. Um, aside from the profanity that's been focused on and the phone call that's been tapped, there's a lot of details about U.S. thinking that has been released in this phone call. 
how do you see that influencing U.S. influence on the ground and what's happening there in Ukraine? Well, I think uh, it's important to note that uh, these messages of what the United States view is, how we view the situation on the ground, is part of the diplomatic conversation that happens with the opposition, that happens with representatives of the government, and that's happened on the ground over the last couple of days as Assistant Secretary Newland has been there. The Secretary also met with both the opposition and, uh, and briefly stopped by a meeting with the Foreign Minister last weekend. So I said this a little bit yesterday, but as a part of the process of diplomacy, you often do have a conversation of what the circumstances are, what your view is. It's, of course, up to the people of Ukraine, whether that's a representative of the, of the opposition or, or others, on what the path forward will be. But, but that's part of the conversation you have uh, through diplomacy. You said that yeah. you, apart from the, the Ukrainians were involved in the conversation as well? Were the, well, are I we said only hearing part of is what has been Oh, you're right. There. I'm sorry. I'm not sure why I said that. That was wrong. <laughs> Thank you. Let's let's note that in the transcript. The, okay. So they were as discussed. far as you know, there were only two people Correct. involved in there this were conversation. Two people. There wasn't Thank anyone you. Else, so. It's a Friday. I apologize. Okay. Um, do we have a new topic? A Syria? Short, short question about Ukraine. Okay. How do you evaluate uh, a visit uh, of Victoria Newland? Uh, mm -hmm. Is it successful or not in general? Uh, well, I don't think our expectation was that her visit would resolve the situation on the ground. Uh, while she was there, um, she not only had a press conference, as I mentioned, but she also met with uh, representatives of the government and representatives of the, of the opposition. And our message continues to be that uh, they both, all sides need to move forward uh, toward the creation of a, of a new government, uh, that we need to encourage uh, a reduction in violence, uh, a peaceful approach to the path forward, and that uh, people need to listen to, uh, the people in the government uh, need to listen to the voices of the people of Ukraine. Uh, Thank you. Sure. Um, you said that the, um, the release of these tapes is, is, is distracting. And I just wondered whether it had distracted um, any of the conversations between Assistant Secretary Newland and uh, particularly Ukrainian President. Uh, now, honestly, Joe, uh, the focus of their conversation was on the path forward. It was not about the release of the tapes and the and the reports. It's, no, it's I understand distracting that. in the in the public domain, certainly. But it didn't compromise or have any effect on her actual talks on the ground because they're not easy talks that she's sure. in. Sure, yeah. of course, it's a challenging situation. But no, um, she was able to have substantive conversations with both the government and the opposition. And do you know if she's had to or? has indeed apologized to any of the Ukrainian opposition leaders who she was characterizing in the telephone call? Well, I know she spoke to this this morning, that uh, she's been in touch with them, of course, and uh, and uh, she has a great working relationship with them, as do other officials from from the United States government and officials from the EU, and, and she fully expects, and we fully expect, that that will continue. No. Ukra Syria. Any more on Ukraine, just to finish that? Okay. Syria. Uh, on Syria, do you comment? Uh, do you have any comment on uh, some reports that say that you and your allies in the Gulf Cooperation Council country are arming feverishly and readying certain, you know, uh, militant elements to attack Damascus on the eve of uh, the the talks on the tenth that they want so they can gain some sort of leverage. I, I'm not even honestly, Said, aware of what specific report you're referring to. Okay. Would well, you know where it was published? Yes, it was published all over the Arab media. Okay. Sorry, I mean, I, I, I use the Arab media. So the, they're saying that, especially in the Gulf, you know, the, the Gulf media, they're saying that uh, the armed opposition is getting arms and it's getting training and it's getting uh, uh, professional advice on how to attack Damascus over the next, you know, 30, 72 hours, whatever it is so they can gain some sort of leverage in the talks that will begin on Monday. I don't have anything on that report for you. Okay. Michael? Now, do you, oh. do you, you know, uh, uh, for the talks on, on, uh, on Monday, what do you expect? What is your role? What will your what role be? What is our be? role, the United yes, States role? Your role? Yes. Well, as it was uh, just a couple of weeks ago, uh, our role is to uh, be there as, uh, as an outside advisor to work with the opposition. Uh, Ambassador Ford will be on the ground, and he'll be leading a team. Uh, we engage with the opposition as well as uh, UN Joint Special Representative Brahimi, uh, the Russians, the representatives of the London 11. Uh, and we're all striving, of course, to do what we can to help Brahimi's efforts succeed. So uh, I expect we'll continue to play a similar role to the one we played uh, in the first round of negotiations. Yeah, it, would that be in light of, you know, during the conversation with CNN, the interview with CNN, the uh, 
the secretary suggested that yeah there there has been some sort of uh, you know uh, some negative aspect to the policy thus far will any change or any change will be reflected in these talks as far as us position in terms of aiding the uh, the opposition sort of more robustly well i think what we what we learned from the last round of talks or what we're encouraging moving forward is certainly for uh, the regime to to uh, encouraging the regime and pushing those who are influential with the regime to encourage them to engage uh, more constructively in the next round, which means discussing the implementation of the Geneva communique, including the establishment of a transitional governing body. Um, and I think we all can acknowledge that there's a lot of work ahead, and we expect the negotiations to be about the implementation of the Geneva communique. Uh, you can discuss other issues, of course, but but that's what we believe the focus should be. And finally, how do you expect the current ceasefire for three days or whatever it is to impact these talks? Well, let me be very clear on that. Um, I think a more apt description is that this is a pause in hostilities to allow humanitarian access. Our understanding is that the deal includes humanitarian pauses for 10 hours on each of the three days to allow the operations to complete. Uh, but again, uh, we've received uh, report, we've actually even received reports, as many of you may have seen, that the regime shelled homes overnight. So. Uh, I don't think ceasefire is an accurate description of what's happening on the ground. Michael. I wanted to follow up on that. Can okay. You, do, you, can you, um, do you have any information? I know it's primarily coming mm -hmm. from the United Nations, but do you have any information on how many people have been able to leave old homes, um, what assistance has been delivered, if any? And also, um, some of the reports had indicated that not only had the shelling uh, occurred, but mm -hmm. it had been um, more substantial than in it had been increased, really, mm -hmm. over previous days. Is that the case, to your knowledge? I, I Unfortunately, we've seen the reports. I would, as you noted, point you to the UN on this. Um, but, you know, it's important to note, since you gave me the um, opportunity here, uh, that we do have, and Elise asked this question yesterday, and I talked to our team to follow up. And mm -hmm. given the, well, the UN is controlling and monitoring and running this entire process, um, given the regime's past actions and its utter disregard for human life, we do not... Um, expect any goodwill uh, will come from the regime. So we are taking every statement that is made with a grain of salt. We've seen the reports overnight, um, and it's a very real possibility that once the evacuations and humanitarian assistance deliveries are complete, uh, the regime could com could bombard the old city of homes, as there has been a trend in the past. We don't know that's going to happen. We hope that's not going to happen, but we have those concerns. In terms of the numbers and specific numbers of people who have been moved out, the UN really has those uh, specific statistics. Apart from stating these concerns publicly, mm -hmm. have, have you conveyed them through Brahimi to through to Russian officials? How have you have you conveyed any sort of message to the um, Assad government that? to try to dissuade them from carrying out this action, and how have you done that? We have in the past. Um, let me check and see if there's any, any specific uh, message conveyed over the last couple of days as it relates to this okay. particular evacuation. Is that something evacuation. you can get back to us on today, Yeah, please. absolutely. I'm happy to. Okay. And are you Syria? No. Any, let's just finish Syria, and then we'll go to the next. Go ahead. Yesterday, there was a, issue, a, a statement issued by the U U.S. Treasury, and a, in that, a, it was arguing that the Iran and uh, several people operatives in <coughs> Iran with the, uh, with the knowledge of the Iranian authorities uh, have been helping Al-Qaeda operatives in Syria for some time. Uh, it's rather appalling uh, uh, statement. Uh, while everybody thinks that the Iran supports Assad regime against Al-Qaeda, how, how do you explain that? Uh, well, I think you're referring to the Treasury designations yesterday, right? Yes. And the way that it was phrased um, or the what it indicated. Uh, I, I'm not sure. Well, can you repeat your question a little bit? I'm Sh trying to understand sure. what you're asking. Uh, according to statement, there are several people. One of them is Yasin al-Suri. Uh, these guys have been uh, sending, transferring fighters mm -hmm. into Syria via Turkey. Uh, and they've been doing this for, for, for a long time. And uh, my question is, how do you explain while uh, everybody thinks Iran is supporting Assad regime against the Al-Qaeda mm -hmm. elements in, in, in Syria? Well, I think it was a reference to financial support for, or some financial supporters Also of, elements. Right, who were designated as part of this. Um, I would point you to the Treasury Department for more specifics on it. I mean, our view and policy hasn't changed on it, but 
that's referring to a designation they announced yesterday. Uh, another way of asking, uh, what is your take on Iranian role in terms of supporting al-Qaeda elements in Syria, which this statement clearly indicates Iran, with the knowledge of the Iranian authorities, have been uh, helping al-Qaeda uh, within Syria? Well, I don't want you to go too far down the road on what the Treasury designation meant or didn't mean. Obviously, you know, we speak for our foreign policy uh, here and what our approach to these issues is from the State Department. I don't really have any new analysis for you to offer. Uh, any more in Syria? Uh, well, go ahead. Jonathan right. Carl, what do we owe this pleasure? Uh, it's great to be back in the okay. building. Okay. Um, I just have a, a few questions on the uh, President's nominees to be ambassadors mm -hmm. around the world. What, what, in a nutshell, are the essential qualifications to be named U.S. ambassador? Well, uh, fortunately, uh, the United States has diplomatic relationships with many, many countries around the world, uh, as you know. And we have ambassadors who are from political backgrounds, who are from financial backgrounds, who have run companies large and small. Uh, but our uh, process has continued to be, or our approach has continued to be, uh, approximately a 70-30 balance of career employees. So people have been working through the Foreign Service and, and serving around the world, uh, building that level of experience. And then about 30 percent uh, from outside uh, the private sector. Uh, over the course of history, uh, there have been many, many ambassadors who have come from outside of the, uh, of the career path who have been very successful. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, just to point you to a, two, uh, to a few, uh, Sergeant Shriver, uh, former Vice President Mondale, uh, per Pamela Harriman, there are many who have been very successful uh, serving in these roles in, in, in countries around the world, and, and, and that's a part of the reason why this, this will continue. So, I mean, as you know, there's been some criticism that of the specific qualifications mm -hmm. of some of the recent nominees. I mean, George Sunis uh, didn't seem to even know what type of government Norway has, uh, called one of the members of the ruling coalition a fringe element. So I, I'm, I'm wondering, does, it, does an ambassador have to have at least some basic knowledge of the country that he is going to? Well, I think ambassadors go to countries, obviously that's the goal, but the ambassadors go to countries to represent the United States, to be a resource to uh, people on the ground. Uh, we've seen those reports, we've all read them, uh, but I would uh, encourage people to give uh, those who have had tougher hearings a chance to go to their countries and, and see what their uh, tenure will 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 uh, entail. Uh, and the judgment can't be made about how effective they'll be or how, how uh, appreciated they'll be by the government until we, we have that uh, happen. So, so right now, you have the, the percentage is 37 percent, which is considerably more political appointees that George Bush had, considerably more than Bill Clinton had. And I'm, I'm going through the list. I mean, most of these gave hundreds of thousands of dollars or raised hundreds of thousands of dollars for the Obama campaign. Uh, how much does it cost to become an ambassador, to be named ambassador in the Obama administration? Jonathan Carl, always a TV question. Uh, we don't determine... What's well, a serious question. I mean, we, I'm not. I'm not. It is a serious question. Uh, we don't name ambassadors from the State Department. Uh, the White House names ambassadors, so I would certainly point you to my old colleagues across the street for that. What I was conveying is that uh, from the State Department point of view, there have been many, many political ambassadors, uh, people who have uh, come from a range of, uh, of histories and backgrounds who've been very successful and worked uh, very effectively in these roles. But, but President, if I could just, just two more on this. But President sure. Obama, when, when he came into office, he said that wherever possible, he would name civil servants, people from the civil service. So was, was it really impossible to find a civil servant who could serve as ambassador, say, to Argentina? Well, again, uh, Jonathan, there are civil servants who are effectively and proudly serving around the world as ambassadors. Uh, more than 60 percent are serving. Obviously, every ambassadorship hasn't been named yet. Uh, and I, I, I know that the secretary and the president and others will continue to strive for that do, do, high do percentage. You, do, do you know if uh, we, we, we learned that uh, uh, Noah Mamet, the nominee to be ambassador to Argentina, has never even set foot in the country of Argentina. Do you know if he speaks Spanish? I don't have his personal biography in front of me, but uh, what I will convey is that, uh, you know, I, I think, as I said before, 
judging somebody's effectiveness or what role they'll play or how, how strong of an ambassador they'll be, you can't do until they've spent some time uh, working in the job in the country. And, and, and just, just very, very last question on this. Sure. So can, can you just explain to me why, um, despite President Obama's promise that he would, wherever possible, name civil servants, why is it that President Obama is naming more political uh, appointees than his predecessor? I would point you to my good buddy Jay Carney for that question, but uh, let me just be clear and just reiterate that uh, there are ambassadors who come from all different backgrounds, whether that is, uh, and political is not even the right definition because these are business leaders. These are people who have worked in the private sector in incredibly impressive roles uh, who are going to represent, serve as public servants overseas. And so many of them are not just qualified, but they're very effective in their roles. And again, there are more ambassadors to be named. Uh, so we'll see what happens. Thank you, Jen. Uh, one moment, say, one moment, one moment, one moment. We'll get right back to you. Go ahead. Since you, were, since you were with the campaign and also with the White House in the, during, for at least part of the first term, did the president actually say, use the word civil servants? that he would promote civil servants into ambassadorship? I'm certain he did not, uh, given that foreign service office there, foreign you, you would like to draw, civil, you, would, civil you, would, you would like to draw a distinction between civil servants career, and foreign Career servants, employees. Foreign service. There, there, there is a distinction, is there not? There certainly is. Um, but they all work together. We all work together in one happy right. family but here, did, Matt. Did, I'm not, I'm not suggesting I know, that they don't. I, I, know I you're just want to make sure. Did, for the record. Because I don't. Well, no, because I don't remember. Because I don't remember him saying that. But if he did, in fact, say civil servants. I mean, did he say civil servants? Or, I, and if he, he did, did say, I, I, did, if he did, did he? Since you were with him at the time, did he mean to say foreign <laughs> servants, or did he mean both? I, I suspect he meant career because employees. The, because the the concern that's been expressed. Mm -hmm. From, the, from these questions, but also from ASA and others, is that ASA in particular is not, is more concerned about foreign servants, mm -hmm. foreign service officers, rather than civil service officers. So I, I just, I want to know, I do not, I don't object to the questions, I just want to know Certainly. if the president meant literally civil servants. Well, I unfortunately do not have a photographic memory of everything he's ever right. stated, but I'm happy to look into these questions, and if there's more to convey, we now, can convey that. More to the point on, one, the, Argen one moment. We'll get on, to you, I promise. on the Argentina question. Mm -hmm. um, the testimony, or at least the, some comments by several, by two senators uh, during that, that nominee's confirmation hearing have provoked some anger in Argentina. Mm -hmm. um, I'm assuming that you stand by what the ambassador, the ambassadorial nominee said regarding um, Argentina being a mature democracy and that you do not agree with the comments of Senator Rubio, and I can't remember who the other senator was, but who, uh, who, who questioned whether um, Argentina was a stable and, and not about to hit another epic financial crisis. Yes, that's correct. That is. Yes, I While we're on, on, on ambassadors, ambassadors okay. yes, absolutely. In the event that the Ambassador Ford uh, leaves at the end of the oh, month. Oh, that was as, quite as, a pivot, yeah, Saeed. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> in the event that he leaves, uh, mm -hmm. how would you replace him? Because uh, on the one hand, you don't have an embassy in Syria, uh, but on the other hand, he's very involved with the opposition and so on. So uh, explain to us how, in this case, how would you appoint? an ambassador to Syria? Well, uh, I uh, understand and appreciate your question, but Ambassador Ford is headed on Monday to right. Geneva to, right. uh, as a part of his very important portfolio of working on these tough issues. So I'm not going to entertain how we would replace somebody who has not announced that they're departing. Uh, do we have any more? Let's finish on, on oh, okay. Argent, two on Argentina. Ladies, ladies first, and then we'll okay. go to you next. Okay, go ahead. Thank you. Um, Given that Senator Rubio called Argentina uh, more insolent than North Korea, is there any concern that there and Argentina reacted angrily this morning? Is there any concern of potential impact in U.S.-Argentinian relations? Uh, I, I would not say that there is. I think uh, we speak from here on U.S. government policy, and obviously there are a range of comments on a range of issues that are made every day from not just members of Congress but officials around the around the country, so I would just point them to, to our view here. Just a quick follow-up on sure. your point that uh, sometimes political appointees can make good ambassadors. Uh, there is a, a track record here, according to the State Department IG's office, 
uh, Obama's appointee to Ambassador to Luxembourg, ran that embassy into the ground, the ambassador to the Bahamas, took 270 personal days in a year and a half. The ambassador to Belgium was reportedly investigated uh, by your own IG's office for uh, procuring prostitutes in the park in front of his house. So I'm, I'm wondering if do you, do you do you do you uh, draw a distinction between people like Walter Mondale who are like lifelong public servants and political donors and bundlers who have no uh, professional or international experience whatsoever? Well, Josh, I would say obviously I'm not going to speak to a range of reports, and there are, there are uh, there are uh, people of all sorts of backgrounds that make poor choices, uh, but and in some of these roles. Uh, but uh, what I was conveying is that there are uh, people who have broad backgrounds, backgrounds in, uh, as leading companies, backgrounds uh, working in important roles in the private sector who uh, take the step to, serve, to be public servants. And that's an important thing I think we should all applaud. Uh, and that's uh, part of what we're seeing. So, Jennifer. yes. Let's go Sorry, we did, boy, okay, go ahead. It Argentina. Seems, it seems that uh, in this... Uh, meeting yesterday in the Committee of Foreign Relations, there was a huge disagreement between the presentation of a, this candidate and what the senators were saying. Mm -hmm. There were a lot of uh, things were mentioned there, like a program for drugs, systems that have to be with the economy that is failing. Uh, some, one senator compared Argentina to North Korea. Uh, also, they talked about the freedom of the press. My question is, this candidate was prepared by the State Department. You know that he was appointed in July last year. He had one year. He didn't visit Argentina in one year, something that we can say, okay, if you are appointed to a country, maybe you have one year to go and see how is Buenos Aires or something like that, have an idea, what is Argentina. Okay, he said that he never visited Argentina. And then I want to know if the State Department prepared him. They gave him information because the difference of what he was talking and what the senators were talking yesterday, it seems that we're a world apart. So I, this is a real situation that, that was surprising, right? Between policies of the State Department, if he was prepared, and mm -hmm. what in the, in the Senate are, are mentioning about what they think about Argentina, right? Well, did you have a question in there? If he that was, was very if, passionate, if, if, though. If, if, if he was, <laughs> if he was, if this <laughs> candidate was in some way help, or he, he received information from the State Department to make his presentation, or he absolutely was not prepared at all, and he went there and he saw really harsh comments about Argentina that maybe he never hear well, about. Well, I can assure you, we work closely with ambassadors. We work closely with them leading up, uh, and we will continue to do that. Okay, good question. Sure. Well, let me see. What is you the question? <laughs> Go ahead. I have you on record. Okay. Um, now, is it typically the practice for people who have been nominated to be ambassador to a country to go visit that country during the period when they are preparing for their uh, nomination hearings? I don't think it is. I think that's I'd love a, to know the answer. Sure. That. No, that's a very good question. I, I don't think it is either, especially given how sensitive it is. But but let me check on that specific well, question. In fact, isn't it <laughs> frowned on yeah. because the uh, Senate has taken uh, takes quite uh, objection it objects quite fiercely to any implication that they are already working with the government. Well, exactly. Well, no, that the, that these nominees are. Are bypassing the confirmation process sure. and assuming and, and assuming that just assuming that they're going to be, well, I think be in. Rare, if ever. And the only cases I can remember are people who uh, are already dealing with those countries mm -hmm. in their current job. So a DAS or a PDAS who is mm -hmm. responsible for five countries uh, and then is named uh, nominated to be ambassador to one mm -hmm. can go to that one because sure. that's part of their job. But otherwise, I don't think it happens. Yes, and, and I think that is correct as, as far as I understand it. But let me just uh, get around to all and of you an out. official Thank explanation you. of that particular policy. Okay. Uh, the, um, <laughs> uh, no, go ahead. Get thanks. in there. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, the secretary has repeatedly made uh, remarks uh, on the Arab Peace Initiative mm -hmm. and how it quote, holds out the possibility of normalizing relations with Israel. He said this numerous times, but in December at the Savan Forum, uh, he said, quote, Israel would enjoy a normal, peaceful relationship the minute this agreement, as in an agreement with the Palestinians, is signed with 22 Arab nations and 35 Muslim nations, 57 countries in all. Um, now, I was with someone with, at the Washington Institute mm -hmm. for Near East Policy uh, the other day who 
made the note that the arab peace initiative has a very distinct qualification to that which is that israel quote completely withdraw all the with withdraw from the occupied terror arab territories including the golan heights so is the secretary working on having the arab league amend the a p i or is the hope that the arab league put aside the API and endorse some future carry plan, or one of those two things has to happen. Otherwise, his his statement isn't entirely accurate. Is that right? Well, um, as you know, uh, we're working with both parties on a framework for negotiations. Uh, we don't have a final framework that's even being discussed at this point. So in terms of what will or won't be in a framework, never mind a final agreement, uh, that's not something I could speak to or we have the information to speak to. Uh, he is in constant touch with the Arab League uh, and the Arab Peace Initiative follow-on committee and briefs them regularly every couple of months about the status of the discussions, the status of, uh, of the negotiations, and where things stand. And they have indicated very publicly their support for those efforts. In terms of what the outcome will be and what will be needed or required, I'm not going to make a prediction of that because we have several steps to take before then. Well, but, but we know that the framework is not going to address the Golan Heights. That, that much we absolutely know unless there's some big surprise in there and Assad's like at this. Well, it's a framework table. which will be the basis for negotiations for a final agreement. Which which won't address the Golan Heights, though, because that has nothing to do with well, Palestinians. I, mean, I would. Syrians, aren't, well, Syrians right. don't have anything so, to do with this. So, uh, the the reason I uh, I'm sticking on this point is mm -hmm. he says the minute this agreement is signed, 22 Arab nations and 35 Muslim nations will recognize or hold out the hope. Well, of Michael, that's it. a figure of speech. It doesn't okay. mean the minute he steps off the stage of an announcement that right. anything will be implemented, but. Uh, beyond that, what I'm trying to get at is that obviously there are discussions and negotiations. If we come to a final status agreement, which has never happened before, uh, on these issues, and he's continuing to brief the Arab League and the follow-on committee, we'll see what needs to happen on one side or the other. But I'm not going to make a prediction of where things stand in terms of what they're willing to yeah, agree to. Maybe, maybe you could answer the question, because it's, it's actually a very good point. Sure. Is there any discussion with the Arabs? With the Arab League follow the, the, the follow-on committee of amending about well about changing it uh, slightly at least slightly so that and uh, recognizing the situation in Syria is a mess mm -hmm. um, and there isn't going to be any way to you don't even know what I mean if there's a transitional government if it's still Assad whatever there aren't any negotiations sure. going on there is there any talk or thought to having the Arabs change their uh, their initiative to to remove or to 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 move the Golan issue out of the immediate and into into some something further down. There's not a discussion the of amending the API. Uh, obviously, there's lots of steps that need to happen before we're even discussing how that piece would be implemented. So that's the point I'm getting at. Okay, but, in, but unless and until it is changed, it can't. It it doesn't. It, it it's hard to see how the secretary can make the promise or the, make the statement that as soon as a deal is done between the Israelis and the Palestinians, then the Arab League Peace Initiative comes into force. Well, right? I would point you to them and see what they say about what they're willing to commit yeah. to. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's a fair point. I was at the same event. And it, it was very specific that they should take out any language that refers to anything other than a deal between the Palestinians mm -hmm. and the Israelis. One, you don't recognize the Arab Peace Initiative, do you? Do you accept it? You you said it's encouraging. The Israelis have never accepted it as as a, as a as a deal that they can work with and recognize. Isn't that the case? How do you mean accept it? Do you do you recognize that this is a deal as submitted by the Arabs in 2002 and amended uh, and accepted at the Arab League conference in Beirut, then amended last April? to include land swaps and so on, that this is a deal that you do accept, which requires Israel to withdraw from it is all not, it occupied is not territories. The it, is, it, is an important, um, it is an important signal from mm. the Arab League. Right. It's an important document, mm. but it is, not the base, it is not the document that's being right. negotiated between the parties, right. no. Uh, but it's, you are not aware that Israel at any time has acknowledged this as a peace initiative that it is willing to sign to. 
do you? That, that's not what's being discussed between right. the parties. But, but you are not aware that Israel has agreed. I think to I this answered your question. Arshad? Thank you. Slightly technical thing, and I okay. don't know if it's been drawn to your sure. attention. Um, the Treasury Department sanctioned an individual whom yesterday, whom it says um, is part of a network of al Qaeda operating in Iran that has used Iran as a transit point mm -hmm. to funnel fighters into Syria to fight with Al Qaeda linked groups. I think we just talked. Groups. We just answered. The yeah, no, but I didn't okay. quite understand the the answer because I guess fundamentally the question is: Do you believe that Iran is uh, arming or aiding or assisting both sides in the conflict in Syria? I don't have any more information on the specific designation, so let me just check and see if there's more to convey. Okay. The fundamental question, though, is, mm -hmm. is that one. Is it, do you, does the U.S. government believe Iran is playing both sides of the coin and aiding fighters on both sides in the Syrian conflict? And we're talking about an individual here uh, who is assisting, so that's an important point. But I okay. will check and Thank see you. if there's more to add. It is within the knowledge of the Iranian authorities, and it has been going for a while. So it is more than individual. I understand your question, but it's about financial support for also so fighters. I will check and see if there's more we can Turkey. convey. And of course, I'd point you to the Treasury Department, who's the experts on this. Go ahead. Turkey. Uh, on Iran, uh, just a, one more here. On Iran, uh, there is a scheduled meeting tomorrow uh, with the IAEA and some uh, Iranian officials to talk about what the Iranians describe as ambiguities in the technical agreement for uh, the nuclear deal with the West. Um, what is the process here in terms of um, information and briefing at the State Department uh, following that consultation in Tehran? Um, uh, obviously, we're in close touch, but as you know, the, the discussions are beginning uh, net two weeks from now on the comprehensive talks. Um, mm -hmm. The IAEA has, for the most part, been a separate process that was started before there was an agreement on a first step agreement. Uh, so in terms of specifically what would be read out, obviously we, we receive briefings and updates uh, on a regular basis, but I'm not aware of anything unique in this case. So you don't think the February 8th technical discussions about these so-called ambiguities are going to impact the February 18th start under the EU? Uh, that's not our expectation, no. And is that, is that Wendy Sherman then who's, who's leading that? Does the, the Secretary February 18th? Uh, I'm, well, sure, on the 18th, mm -hmm. but the briefing following the technical conversations. It, it really depends. I, I would I would caution you against over cranking what a briefing is. I mean it is it is regular consultations and updates on what's happening on one side or the other. Under Secretary Sherman will of course uh, be the lead uh, mm. who will be headed uh, for the talks in Vienna coming up in two weeks. Uh, but in terms of who will receive any update, I don't have a, a specific name for you. Foreign Minister Zarif mm -hmm. uh, made some comments on uh, Ms. Sherman that were pretty harsh, saying that she should stick to reality when she's testifying on the negotiations in front of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, saying that uh, her comments were hindering the process. Do you have a response to that? Uh, well, we all know that everybody has their own political constituencies, and sometimes statements are made uh, as a result of that. Right, but the, um, so you're referring to Zarif. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> Wendy does not have a political constituency, yeah. yes. Uh, uh, Senator Menendez, who has been a strong, in fact, the author of uh, the bill that you ha and the administration has mm -hmm. uh, opposed, uh, came out with a, a pretty uh, significant speech yesterday on the floor of the Senate, um, conditionalizing his, his bill and saying that it may not be the appropriate time. Mm -hmm. um, APAC then came out with a statement saying, we agree with the chairman that stopping the Iranian nuclear program should rest on bipartisan support and that there should not be a vote at this time mm -hmm. on the measure. Do you commend APAC for the statement? Uh, well, uh, we welcome them to the uh, support for the diplomatic path forward. Yeah. Uh, on the Israel issue, two things. One, do you have anything to say about your, your um, group, your delegation in Tunisia walking out of the um, speech by uh, Mr. Larajani? And Actually, I have a second one. I think I've seen that, Matt, but I don't know that I have anything on it for you. So let me get something for you post briefing. All right. And, 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 uh, sorry, and then go ahead. second, on, mm -hmm. do you have any response, favorable or unfavorable? I suspect 
there won't be anything unfavorable to uh, poor Mr. Lieberman's speech this morning in which he gave somewhat of a uh, strong defense of the secretary in his efforts? Well, we certainly uh, welcomed his remarks and his sentiment and the importance of the peace process. And it's a reflection of, of course, the belief of many people in Israel that, that a two-state solution is the right uh, outcome at the end of this process. Do you, do you believe that, that, that these words coming from Foreign Minister Lieberman, someone who uh, just you know several years mm -hmm. ago was not exactly the most, you know, was not uh, looked upon by the administration as a particular particular friend mm -hmm. uh, or a friend of, of the peace process, do, do, you, do you think that this marks a, a turning point in the somewhat caustic uh, uh, back and forth that's been going on since, mm -hmm. since, uh, since the Secretary's comments? In well, it, it certainly is a, a powerful statement and a powerful message given um, his history and his background on these issues and, and where his, his view was. Uh, we'll see moving forward. It doesn't mean there's an end to opponents for a uh, two-state solution, an end to opponents of a peace process, but certainly, uh, you know, we're hopeful that we can get back to the focus on, on the difficult issues at hand. Uh, let's just do say, say one at a time, just because yeah. give everybody a chance. Thank, thank you. Does Go ahead. the Secretary believe in the goal of a nuclear weapons-free Middle East? Uh, I think... Uh, <laughs> I think, uh, Josh, that I think we've talked about this before. I'm having sort of a flashback <laughs> moment. <laughs> Re refresh me. Uh, look, Josh, I know uh, we, can we encourage anybody, uh, any country to sign on to the NPT. Uh, you're familiar with uh, the conversations we have with a range of countries on these issues. Um, you know, that's beyond a, that. You're not, so you won't say whether he's for the goal of a nuclear weapons free Middle East? Uh, I think you're familiar with our actions, which speak to what our efforts well, are. Let me put a fine. Let, I got this. Let, let me put a fine. <laughs> let, let me put a finer point on it. How, has the secretary been communicating to uh, Arab and Gulf leaders that he intends to, uh, following an Iranian nuclear deal, uh, pursue a weapons-free, a, a, a nuclear weapons-free Middle East? Uh, I don't think that's been uh, part of his talking points. Obviously, we're focused on our efforts as it relates to the P5 plus one negotiations and a comprehensive deal. Uh, our efforts of in, in our engagement with a range of countries where we have concerns about their programs. Uh, so that's not that in his continue. talking points, but has he been saying that to those leaders in those meetings? Uh, not that I'm aware of, Josh. Does the Secretary agree with the President's stated goal of having a nuclear weapons-free world? Of course. He does. And is the Middle East part of what we would call the world? It is part the of the world. world. No, 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 so no, there, should no. we therefore assume... <laughs> All right, bringing it back to the level of... Reality. Okay, so <laughs> that is reality. Yeah, uh, but not aspirationally. I'm talking to, on a policy level in his communications mm -hmm. with leaders in the region in the context of the Iran P5 plus one negotiations sure. and the discussions surrounding those nega negotiations. Um, uh, my information is that the Secretary has raised the issue of a nuclear weapons free Middle East as part of his overall vision. Well, certainly, uh, as Matt said, as the President has said, we have concerns about. Uh, efforts to, uh, toward creating and using nuclear weapons anywhere in the world. Uh, and he's expressed that, of course, uh, as, it, as it has been necessary in certain meetings. But I'm not sure where you're getting at here, Josh. Do you have another question? No. OK. Can we, can we stick around the, the Palestinian-Israeli issue? Sure. Because I think we, we went back and forth on okay. this. Can you update us on any kind of talks that may be going? Is, is uh, Envoy Endic doing anything this week or next week? Well, I believe he may still be on the ground, and he's been meeting with both parties uh, as we work to close the gap, uh, narrow the gap on the uh, on a, a, a framework for negotiations. Okay, thing. so and there are no plans for you guys to go and and meet with both sides over there. I don't have any tr announcements to make about a trip to to uh, the region. I could just yeah. one more follow up sure. On the, uh, on the Iran bill, is the administration at this point confident that? Um, that there won't be a vote in the Senate, and I know we've visited this mm -hmm. multiple times, but should a vote come to pass, uh, is that, as the Iranians have said, a violation of the joint plan of action, or is the full implementation of the Nuclear Weapon Free Iran Act of 2013 a violation of the joint Well, plan I think the important point here, which I've made in the past, but I realize circumstances have changed a little bit um, in, in in favor of uh, no vote, I, I should say. But um, it's not just about what specific technical piece would violate. It's about what message we're sending uh, during fragile negotiations with 
partners around the world who have also committed uh, not to move forward with new sanctions legislation uh, while we are about to approach uh, comprehensive talks. So uh, that's why the Secretary, the President, and others have continued to make the case that we should not take action uh, as it relates to putting new sanctions in place. Uh, I understand it's a, me a messaging question, mm -hmm. but is it also a technical question? It's not just a messaging question. It's, right. a, it's, a, it's a strategic question as it relates to the negotiations. And, uh, mm -hmm. and the 42 senators uh, in the Republican caucus who say that this is becoming a partisan issue, um, this issue that has consistently been a unifying mm -hmm. force in the Senate, is that a concern to the administration? It is our view is it is not a partisan issue. It is about what is the best path forward, and that that's the diplomatic path forward as it relates to Iran and our concerns about Iran acquiring a nuclear weapon. That's why we think legislation, whomever supports it, whether it's Democrats or Republicans, is not the right step. Jen, Jen I have a question uh, probably on Turkey uh -huh. about the breaking news as we were coming in about the plane that has been diverted from the Ukraine to Turkey. Um, mm -hmm. from the State Department's conversations with your Turkish and Ukrainian allies. What can you tell us about the situation? Do you believe this is an isolated incident? And how serious do you assess this threat to be? Uh, well, Catherine, as you noted, this just happened before, uh, or the reports of this just happened before I came out here. Uh, I would, of course, refer you to the Turkish government. We're in close touch. Our, our team on the ground is in close touch with Turkish authorities, but I don't have any uh, analysis for you at this point on what it means or what it's an indication of. When was Secretary Kerry made aware of the flight diversion? Uh, he was in a bilateral meeting with the Japanese uh, while these events took place, so I would assume after it, but I haven't seen him since the bilateral meeting. Do you think this will change the State Department's travel warning that's out there for U.S. citizens or change any security plans on the ground in Sochi? Well, Catherine, obviously we take in a range of information as we make those evaluations, uh, but again, because this just happened and Turkish authorities are looking into it and what it means, I, I don't want to go too far on, on what it will mean in terms of what we implement. Let, let's look at, I'm not going anywhere. Let's just do one at a time here. Uh, in the blue uh, blazer there. Thank you. Just I know. Sorry. Matt, Matt has weekend plans. Go ahead. Um, quick question on the, the rules changes for asylum seekers that were published this week in the Federal Register. As you may know, some folks on the Hill have said that the administration doesn't have the power to reinterpret uh, the law in this way. How do you respond to that? What um, uh, legal authority would state side. I understand it's both state and DHS. Mm -hmm. I really don't have information on this, so let me talk to DHS and talk to our team who works on these issues, and and we can uh, follow up with you following. Okay, and one other issue: Do mm -hmm. you have apparently the uh, majority staff of the House Foreign Affairs Committee came out with a report on Benghazi today and was critical of the ARB um, for not uh, reviewing or commenting on um, senior officials, including Secretary Clinton, uh, Ambassador Kennedy. Do you have any response? Um, to that report, uh, do you have a specific question about the report? Or Just, I mean, would you would you agree that um, you know there were significant issues, questions left unanswered by the, the ARB's failure to comment on or review the conduct of senior officials? Uh, we would disagree with that, as I'm sure will come as no surprise. Uh, there was a thorough investigation, uh, in, including interviews with more than 100 people, the review of thousands of documents. Uh, and hours of video that were included, uh, and the ARB found uh, no credible el uh, evidence that relevant decisions on security in Benghazi uh, rose above the assistant secretary level. I think that's what was addressed specifically in the report, or that contradicts what uh, the ARB says. Um, you know, this is a, an issue we've talked about a bit in here and has been heavily litigated uh, over the course of time, but I think the facts are contrary to uh, some of the findings in that report. And what we're focused on is continuing to implement the ARB recommendations, continuing to uh, secure embassies around the world, and, and, and moving forward. On North Korea, please. On North Korea. Uh, North let's Korea. just do a couple more here, because it's been a, a marathon adventure here. Go can ahead. You, can you confirm a media report that um, human rights envoy uh, King will visit Pyongyang next Monday? Uh, I don't have. I talked about this a little bit yesterday, and and our uh, our uh, our my information has not changed, or what I can provide to all of you has not changed, which is that uh, we have long offered to send Ambassador King 
uh, to North Korea. That hasn't changed. Uh, our focus here is on securing uh, the, um, the release of Kenneth Bay. Uh, because of that, we're not going to outline every element of communication, every effort that's underway, uh, because that's what our focus Does is on. Does North Korea invite uh, that uh, king, Ambassador King? I don't have anything new to tell you about so it. So you're saying no decision has been made <coughs> yet? I just don't have any new information I to provide to you. Changed, and you said the information that I have to provide you has not changed. Um, so you have information about this that you can't provide us. Uh, I was just conveying that at any point in this process, Arshad, we're not going to provide every specific effort okay. that's underway. General, so. Deputy uh, Secretary Burns met with uh, Ambassador of South Korea mm -hmm. Ang Young this morning. Do you have anything new to add out there? I think I do. Let me make sure. And if I don't, for some reason, I know it's available, so I can get that to all of you. Um, let us get that to you right after the briefing, okay? Right, thank you. Sure. Can I stay on Korea? Uh, sure. Let's just do a couple more here. Go ahead. Um, so yesterday, the Virginia House of Delegates passed a bill on the East Sea Sea of Japan issue. And given that both the governments of South Korea and Japan have gotten involved in this, is the State Department planning to communicate any kind of position to Governor McAuliffe on whether or not he should sign the legislation? Um, this isn't an issue we're working on at the State Department, and I don't expect that will change. Okay. Sure. You were asked about uh, this new law yesterday, internet censorship law, mm -hmm. and uh, it passed the Parliament. Mm -hmm. Now it's at the desk of the President. Good. Uh, do you have any comment uh, on that? Uh, apart from yesterday. Nothing new to add to yesterday. Let's uh, do the last two uh, here. Go ahead. Short question about f press freedom in Turkey. Uh, Azerbaijani journalist uh, Mahir Zeynelov, who is working for Turkish State today, Zaman, deported uh, this morning from Turkey because of his critical tweets to the Turkish government. Mm -hmm. Would you like to make any comment on this? Uh, we are looking into uh, these unsettling reports. As we have said, we have been and continue to be strong advocates for freedom of expression around the world, and we believe that democracies are strengthened by the diverse voices of their people. Uh, we look to Turkey as a democracy and ally to uphold the fundamental freedoms of expression, assembly, and association. We believe that an independent pluralistic media is critical to a healthy and strong democracy, but I don't have any specific uh, confirmation of any of the details that have been reported. Uh, Scott, why don't we finish off with you? Do you have anything about uh, the arrest of the Russian environmentalist Igor Tishko? Sure. And actually, can I add on to that? There are reports of uh, LGBT activists being arrested uh, just as the opening ceremony was going on. Could you? And others as well being arrested. Mm -hmm. Do you have any thoughts about that? Another footnote on that sure. one. You open by pen. showing the video and by talking about how the U.S. Olympic team highlights the diversity, openness, and I think it says inclusion of the United States. Was that a deliberately meant to evoke or sort of be a counterpoint to the Russian uh, laws uh, uh, that? The, the laws that are widely regarded as anti-gay? Well, Arshad, I think our view of those laws is, as we've no, made no secret of that, and we remain concerned by a disturbing trend in the Russian Federation of legislation, prosecutions, and government actions aimed at uh, suppressing dissent in groups that advocate for human rights. As you know, we think gay rights are human rights, uh, and this, these LGBT laws uh, and propaganda are part of that effort. Uh, you're familiar with who is representing the United States in the delegation. Uh, it's important to note and represent what our views are, and, and certainly uh, all of that uh, reflects the views of the United States on, on this particular issue and how it contrasts. Um, sorry, go ahead, Scott. Now I forget your question. It's okay. It was about the environmentalist. Yeah, Igor Vitichko. The environmentalist, yes. I think I have something on that in here. One moment. Uh, we are, and this uh, loops in all of your questions, I believe, uh, the United States is troubled by the arrests of and government pressure on peaceful civil society activists around the Sochi region of Russia in the days leading up to the Olympics. These arrests call into question the Russian government's commitment to allowing individuals to exercise their basic freedoms. The United States continues to support the rights of all Russians to exercise these fundamental freedoms of expression and assembly, these rights are enshrined in the Russian Constitution as well as in international agreements to which Russia is a party. 
Thank you. Oh, I, did you have another one? Sorry. Yeah, unfortunately. Okay. Sorry. Um, you said there was one on that. They call into question the commitment. So are you um, entirely satisfied with the, with the opening ceremony and the what, what's happened around it, not in terms of the actual ceremony itself, obviously, but in terms of <clears throat> the Russian government's uh, steps, measures that, that, that they've taken that they think they need to have, that they, they think they need to take to secure the place. Well, certainly work in, oh, security Well, wise. no, okay. but I mean, to, I mean, I think the, <coughs> Pardon me. the arrests are being, <coughs> thank you very much. The arrests are being made, I believe, under the whole, this uh, larger idea of keeping the games peaceful and safe. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, that's what I mean. I don't mean like a terrorist threat or anything like that. Well, I, I, look, I think I, I, I don't think I have analysis of every single arrest and the meaning and the history on it, but it's clear there's a trend with uh, people who are peacefully protesting or peacefully expressing their viewpoint, whether it's environmental activists or uh, some LGBT activists being arrested, and, and I think it would be hard yeah. to argue they're posing a threat. And then my last one is that, and I pretty sure you won't have a comment on it, but mm -hmm. a former of, uh, official for this department has pleaded guilty today to passing classified information to one of our colleagues. Wondering if you have any comment about that. I do not, given it's an ongoing uh, process well, with the Department of Justice. it's not going anymore once he's pleaded I guilty. I don't have anything for you on it. Uh, thanks, everyone. Have a nice weekend. Thank you, you too. Thank you.